So a couple of days ago, I posted a video titled Itachi is teaching Sarada or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was called. And the general premise of the video was that in order for Sarada to remain relevant in the post time skip period of Boruto, she was going to need some pretty major upgrades power wise. As we had already seen characters like Sasuke, somebody with decades more experience than her and EMS and a six Tome Rinnegan get absolutely low diffed by high level Boruto threats like Jigen and especially Ishiki. And thus if Sarada, who doesn't have as much chakra, isn't as fast, isn't as strong, isn't as experienced, and has worse dojutsu than Sasuke, as she's only a dual MS wielder and really has no current route to ever be an EMS wielder or a Rinnegan wielder, would really stand no chance against any of the even semi-high-level threats that the Boruto world is now currently facing. And thus, anybody who's classified as a Jigen-level threat or higher would be able to absolutely mop the floor with Sarada, and that's a problem. As we learn in Chapter 5 of Tubu Vortex that Sasuke is training Boruto because he believes that one day Boruto and Sarada are going to have to battle against some massively big bad, which sets up Sarada as one of the most important characters in the entirety of the Boruto universe moving forward. Now, as to what this big bad is going to be, we just don't know. That big bad could be Hidari, the Sasuke claw grime. It could be Amado, it could be Code, or it could be Shibai, or it could be Kawaki. There's really no way of knowing who this battle is going to be against. However, if Sasuke believes that Boruto needs to be trained so that he can be involved in this fight, then it's fair to assume that Sarada should also be able to hang with a fully trained trained Boruto. But really, no matter how you look at it, the idea of Sarada even getting to the level of current Boruto seems impossible, as current Boruto is stronger than Naruto and Sasuke combined. And thus, even if Sarada's MS abilities are insanely broken, and are what we've theorized they're going to be, are genjutsu similar to that of Kodo Matsukame, however, instead of changing the person's mind at will, it simply works by swaying that person to whatever ideologies you stand by. That is to say, if Sarada is to cast somebody under this genjutsu, she's able to adapt them to her worldview, and thus make them essentially an instant ally. And the abilities of her second MS would be similar to that of a Matarasu. However, instead of firing black, infinitely burning flames, she fires golden flames that heal and pacify the heart of whoever is burning in them. That is to say that she's able to burn the hatred or illuminate the heart of whoever she engulfs in her flames, which would also be a good way to instantly pacify and make anybody an ally. And while these MS abilities would make Sarada heavily relevant in Shippuden, unfortunately with the way that Boruto is heading, that isn't nearly enough. And thus, when it really boils down to it, we would have to look elsewhere to find Sarada enough power to make her relevant in post time skip Boruto. And really the only other place that we could look that wouldn't involve a massive story change or massive change to Sarada would be her Susano, which she'll have as she is a dual MS wielder. And thus we hypothesized in that video that Sarada would receive Itachi's spiritual weapons. Well, okay then, Nick. Why are we talking about this again? Well, because while the evidence I used to substantiate that point in that video is solid, today, even more solid evidence fell onto my lap. Undeniable, rock-solid evidence that Sarada will at least have the Yadamir, which also explains why she isn't affected by Ada's omnipotence. Finally, we have what feels like to me a rock-solid explanation as to why Sarada is unaffected by the massive worldwide brainwashing. Because, well, obviously, there's been theories that Sarada received Hagoromo's chakra from her father Sasuke, or possibly because she's in love with Boruto, she isn't affected by the omnipotence, but both of those theories were contingent on a lot of what-ifs. This is not, and thus I genuinely believe we've found the right answer. But before we get to diving into that real answer, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you like the idea of me diving into the real answers to some of your favorite anime, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime. And if you just like the idea of me talking about anime, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Utaku Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you just want to look like somebody who keeps up with all things anime and manga, go ahead and meander into my merch store, TakuzAnonymous.net where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. So, Sarada, the pieces are starting to come together for us to figure out what her future looks like. If the addition of a Susano isn't enough to make her relevant in the power sphere of Boruto, then naturally her Susano must get some kind of upgrade. And really when it comes down to upgrading a Susano, the only upgrade that one can receive is spiritual weapons. But unfortunately, in order to make Sarada Susano relevant, we need to go beyond your standard Susano weapons. It can't just be a bow and arrow, it can't just 
just be a katana it can't even just be two katana and thus when it really comes down to it the only natural conclusion to glean here is that in order to make Sarada Susana relevant she needs to get Itachi's spirit weapons so known as the Yadamir and the sword of Totsuka now when I made the original video the evidence I used to prove this point was that Itachi and Sarada are very similar characters and the manifestation of Susano, Emma's abilities and Susano weapons are all based off who you are as a person, and more specifically, who you are as a person when you awaken your MS. And since Sarada and Itachi are similar people who were in similar situations during the awakening of their MS, it stands to reason that not only should their MS abilities be similar, but also their Susanos. See, both characters are split between two factions that they love. That is to say that both Itachi and Sarada are split between their love for Konoha and their love for something or somebody else. For Itachi, it was the love of his clan, the love of his friends, and the love of his family. And for Sarada, it's the love that she has for Boruto and her father, who's now considered a rogue shinobi. And both Sarada and Itachi act as spies for one of these factions in order to protect the one person they love more than anything else. And protection is going to be a pretty key talking point throughout the duration of this video, so keep that in your mind. Now, the person that Itachi was obviously trying to protect is Sasuke, and the person that Sarada is trying to protect is Boruto. Well, one could also argue that she's also trying to protect Sasuke, and thus I figured that with her need for additional power and the likeness of her motivations to Itachi, it seemed all but pretty obvious that she was going to get Itachi's spiritual weapons. But now even more evidence has fallen into my lap to prove this point, which has not only proven my point, but also elucidated the mystery surrounding why Sarada is unaffected by omnipotence. See, one thing that I didn't bring up in my original video is that it's very obvious to anybody with color-seeing eyes that Sarada's design is very much based off of Itachi's design. As Sarada in pre-time skip and post-time skip only wears two colors, red and black. And will the design choices with post-time skip Sarada make it entirely much more obvious that she is based off Itachi? There's always been hints there. But genuinely, the most important thing to talk about here is her post-time skip look. See, Sarada's post-time skip look has her wearing a black jacket with a red lining, which is very clearly an homage to the Akatsuki jacket, which is a black well, I guess robe with a red lining. But the likenesses go beyond just coloration. Because while one could argue that Sarada wearing a black and red jacket could be an homage to Sasuke's time in Heavy, Sarada also wears a black choker. Specifically, a black choker with a silver ring. Now, Sasuke never wore a necklace at all. However, Itachi always did. And Itachi's necklace, while not technically a choker, was rather small and was a black string with three silver rings. And while there's no real consensus on why Itachi wears his necklace in the first place, it's fair to assume that Sarada's necklace is based off of his. When you tie this into the fact that Boruto post-time skip returned to Konoha with his grandfather's technique, Flying Thunder God, people believe that a precedent is being set that this new generation in Boruto is looking back through their past generations for a way to unlock a new level of power. And that's why Boruto tapping into the juices of his grandfather, he is setting a precedent for other characters in the story to do something similar to that. That is to say that this new generation Boruto is going to look through their past generations and try and find the most powerful techniques biologically available to them. And thus people have begun to hypothesize that as a foil to Boruto learning Flying Thunder God, that it would make sense and would be rather cool to see Sarada learn Itachi's crow technique. Which when you consider how curious Sarada is about Itachi and the fact that Sasuke said multiple times that he would tell Sarada about Itachi, though he never got around to telling her about Itachi, means that there's a possibility that during the time skip, Sarada got fed up with it and just asked Sakura. And while there's no way for us to really know as to whether or not Sakura knows enough about Itachi to tell her the things that she needs to know about Itachi, Sakura at the very least would know that he used crows, he was a good guy, and that he killed his entire clan in order to save Sasuke. Sasuke may not be a great husband, but Sakura should know at least that much. And thus, it's a possibility that during the time skip that Sarada became heavily familiar with Itachi and thus decided to look back in time like she's done prior in order to try and find power now that Sasuke was absent. And thus lines of power would begin to be drawn between Sarada and Itachi. And thus both Boruto and Sarada would be using the techniques of their slain relatives to protect the things that those relatives cared more about than anything else. Konoha, and technically Naruto and Sasuke, which would be a fantastic narrative circle. But I didn't bring you here today to talk about color schemes and possible history lessons that happened during the time skip. No, the true piece of evidence that's fallen into my lap fell into my lap this morning while I was checking my email. Because this morning I got an email that said, have you seen the Yadamir? It's basically just Sarada's MS design. Now I'd like to make this clear that I've technically never seen the Imperial Regalia of Japan. Well, 
that's not 100% true. Dev googled the Imperial Regalia of Japan on Google Images, and I've seen images of them. However, I simply believe that the images that I saw of the Magatama, the Yadamir, and the Blade of Kusanagi were artist renderings, and therefore not accurate depictions of what the Imperial Regalia of Japan looked like. Because so far as I knew, nobody outside of the priests that keep the Imperial Regalia and the Emperor know what those things look like. And why did I think that? Well, because the Imperial Regalia of Japan are purposely shrouded in mystery. Let's do a quick history lesson here to help you understand where this misconception of mine came from. The Imperial Regalia of Japan were said to be brought down to Earth from heaven by a legendary figure known as Niningi no Mikoto. Now, Niningi no Mikoto is the ancestor of the Japanese imperial line and the son of the sun goddess Amaterasu. Now, Niningi no Mikoto would go on to have children on Earth as they were sent down to Earth to pacify Japan. And his children would go on to have more children, one of which would end up being the first emperor of Japan, Emperor Jimu, who ascended to the throne of Emperor in Japan in 660 BC. And while there is technically no physical evidence that Emperor Jimu ever existed, some of the earliest history books in Japanese history, like Nihon Shoki, detailed that Emperor Jimu was the first emperor of Japan. And considering the fact that Nihon Shoki was written in 700, it's about as good a piece of evidence as we're gonna get. But I guess unfortunately for Japan and the rest of the world, really, physical evidence tracking of history didn't start until Nihon Shoki, at least so far as we know. And thus, things that we can verify happened in Japan don't really start until about 700 AD. So there's about 1300 years between Emperor Jimu and the writing of Nihon Shoki. Because official records of Japanese history really start around 700 AD, so this is when we get the first real official records of the Imperial Regalia being passed to ascending emperors. Because that's how the three Imperial Regalia of Japan work. Every single time a new emperor ascends, the key priests of the central shrine and whatever kingdom they're currently ruling over will present the three imperial regalia of japan to the new ascending emperor thus the only time that the three imperial regalia are ever in the same place is when a new emperor is ascending yes that's right usually the three imperial regalia of japan aren't in the same place in fact every single one of the items goes to a different key shrine around japan until a new emperor ascends and we technically don't know where they go see because while this isn't confirmed, it's believed that the sword is located at Atsutsu Shrine in Nagoya, the jewel is located at the Three Palace Sanctuaries in Kokyo, which is also known as the Imperial Palace in Tokyo, and the mirror is located in the Ise Grand Shrine in the Mie Prefecture. But like I said, we don't know this for sure, because it's not like any of the Imperial Regalia are put on display in any of these shrines. It's just believed that these are the shrines where they stay. And when the Imperial Regalia are presented to the Emperor, they're done so in sealed wooden boxes, as to not allow the public who are watching the ceremony to see the Imperial Regalia. See, because Japan doesn't want anybody seeing or analyzing these three treasured items, as they believe that once they're analyzed, they'll be demythologized. That is to say that the mythology of these being passed down through heaven to all of the Emperor emperors who are a descended line of the literal god of the sun would lose a little bit of its magic if everyone was like oh a sword that tie that into the fact that technically the blade of kusanagi that's passed to emperors nowadays is not the original at least we think it's not the original they'll never say that because in the year 1185 the at the time six-year-old emperor of japan on toku sunk on a ship that had two of the three imperial regalia on it and two of those imperial regalia were a the sword of kusanagi and b the jewel the magatama now the sword of kusanagi as a sword sunk to the bottom of the ocean but the jewel the magatama was actually in a wooden box and that wooden box floated so it was able to be retrieved. And thus, because technically one of the three items is no longer the original, and because they don't want the items to be demythologized, I hate that word, you'll have to excuse me for the fact that when I look up images of the three Imperial Gilly of Japan, I just go, oh, those are artist renderings, or maybe the closest approximation of what they'll look like. Because Japan has dedicated so much manpower, time, and effort to making sure that nobody knows what they look like, that it's safe to assume that we would actually have no idea what they look like. And while we technically don't know what they look like, as even the emperor who receives the gifts isn't allowed to open the boxes to look at the imperial regalia. As it stated, one emperor a thousand or so years ago tried to open one of the boxes, and when they opened it, white smoke raised out of it, and one of his aides had to run by his side and quickly close the box. There is apparently widely accepted renderings of what these three items would look like based off what a mirror, a sword, and a jewel bracelet would look like from the time period when these items would have been created. And therefore, when you look up the imperial regalia, 
of Japan, what you're finding are renderings, not photos. And because of that, I never really took what I was seeing all that seriously. However, when you consider the fact that there is one rendering of all three of the items, which is widely accepted to be what the items look like, and that we have the same access to the internet that Kishimoto has, it would make sense to assume that when we think of what the Yadamir, the sort of Kusanagi, or the Magatama look like, we have the same idea as Kishimoto, because even though he's an incredibly important man in Japan, he super hasn't seen the Imperial Regalia of Japan. And really, that's all that matters, at least so far as it pertains to this video. That when it comes down to what Kishimoto thinks the Yadamir looks like, it's the same as you and me, and it's a Google search away. And when you Google search the Yadamir or the Imperial Regalia of Japan, the Yadamir has a rather interesting design, and a design that'll seem eerily familiar to a lot of you. As to say, at the center of the Yadamir, there is an eight-pointed sun-looking symbol with a black pupil-like circle in the center. So, you know, exactly Sarada's MS design. Cody, this is the part where you do a side-by-side -side if you're not already currently doing a side-by-side. -side. However, if just the sheer happenstance of the fact that Sarada's MS design is literally ripped from the Yadamir isn't enough to prove to you that Sarada will one day inherit the Yadamir, maybe this will help nudge you along. See, I've always thought it weird that Kishimoto specified that the Yadamir was able to reflect all physical and spiritual attacks, since we technically never saw Itachi use the Yadamir to reflect anything even close to that of a spiritual attack. And while we don't really see Itachi use the Yadamir a whole lot of times, period, anytime that Itachi does use the Yadamir, it's to reflect physical attacks. And that kind of made sense because of the way that the Yadamir was described to work. So the Yadamir was described to work by being able to match the elemental release of whatever ninjutsu was fired at it. So let's say you fire a great fireball technique at Itachi and he uses the Yadamir to reflect it. The Yadamir would match the flame release of that great fireball technique and reflect it. And since the Yadamir worked by matching the elemental release of the ninjutsu fired at it, I kind of scratched my head at the concept of how it would work at reflecting a spiritual attack. Would it simply match the spiritual elemental release being launched at it and reflect it, or does it just simply make Itachi or any wielder of the Yadamir immune to spiritual attacks? I don't really know, and we never had a circumstance in which to see how it would work, so we can't really know for sure. But as I really got into thinking about how Sarada could possibly inherit the Yadamir, I started to come to the conclusion that what if the real reason that the Yadamir was listed to be able to reflect spiritual attacks wasn't for Itachi? What if the real reason that the Yadamir was said to be able to reflect spiritual attacks was for a future inheritor, and that future inheritor was Sarada. I mean, because think about it. Within the confines of Naruto or Naruto Shippuden, there's no reason for us to say that the Yadamir is able to reflect spiritual attacks. Now, mind you, my definition of spiritual attacks would be Genjutsu. And I think the only person dumb enough to try and use Genjutsu on Itachi was Kuranai. And thus, Itachi having a shield that makes him immune to Genjutsu doesn't really feel like something he needs. But it is something that Sarada would need. See, because while Genjutsu was incredibly common while Itachi was alive, spiritual attacks in an overarching sense are now much more common in Boruto than they were in either Naruto or Shippuden, as the world is now being plagued by things like Ada's omnipotence, or the Claw Grimes bites, or karma markings, all things that could be gleaned as spiritual attacks. I mean, a karma marking has the ability to completely erase your entire spirit and override it with the DNA and personality of an Otsutsuki. Ada was able to launch an attack on the entire world that changed who they thought was Kawaki and who they thought was Boruto. And the Claw Grimes, modified by code, now have the ability to not only bite you and turn you into a tree, but also to download your personality, abilities, and chakra and upload it into a divine tree version of you that wants to kill the person you love most. And all three of these things could very easily be classified as spiritual attacks. And thus, the real reason that Sarada is immune to Ada's omnipotence is because... She's the inheritor of the Yadamir. And if you think about it timeline-wise, Sarada awoke her MS almost simultaneously to the Omnipotence striking the entire world. And while yes, obviously Omnipotence did happen first, and Sarada was not immediately affected by it, it's a possibility that she was always going to be the inheritor of the Yadamir, and therefore she was always at least slightly immune to spiritual attacks. There's also the fact that Omnipotence doesn't change your mind immediately, as those affected by Omnipotence have been seen questioning why their memories were scrambled in the early days of being affected by it. We saw this both from Sasuke and Shikamaru. And, and while Sarada was decidedly less affected than Sasuke and Shikamaru, it could have been because she was on the precipice of unlocking her MS. And therefore, the real way that Sarada remains relevant in Boruto is the fact by simply acting 
activating her MS, she becomes immune to spiritual attacks. As by simply activating her MS, she now has two of the symbols of the Yadimir shining brightly in her eyes. See, because when Sarada unlocked her MS, we made a couple of logical connections to other things that have happened throughout Naruto and things that we knew. When Sarada unlocked her MS, the sun, the first connection that we made was a symbol shown to us in the last, where two factions of Toneri's clan on the moon were split between a sun faction and a moon faction. And this sun and moon faction looked like Sarada's MS and Ada's Senrigan. And thus we came to the natural conclusion that the awakening of Sarada's MS is supposed to paint her as the natural enemy and foil to Ada. Thus we believed that Sarada would be the key to destroying omnipotence. And on top of that, we believed on a much shallower level, since Sarada is the representation of the end of the cycle of hatred, that her MS is having the symbol of the sun is supposed to represent the fact that she is going to be a massive illuminating force for the world. A force that could possibly burn away hatred or shine the light of truth on the real reality of the world and how it was altered. And now the connection has been made between Sarada's MS and the Yadimir that all but just confirms the previous suspicions that we have. As Sarada's immunity to Ada's omnipotence comes from her connection to the Yadimir and its ability to negate spiritual attacks. And thus this is actually why Sarada is painted as the foil to Ada and why the moon and the sun clans were battling against each other in the last. As Sarada through the power of the Yadimir may find a way to spread her immunity to others, which could possibly begin to explain why Sumire is also unaffected by Ada's omnipotence, and could also begin to explain why Sarada was able to break Sasuke out of the omnipotence so easily. But we can't say that for sure. But what we can say, at least relatively for sure, is that Sarada will at least have the Yadimir. And if she's gonna have the Yadimir, she's probably gonna have the Sword of Totsuka as well. And while Sarada doesn't have an EMS, and therefore Husasano will never have legs or wings, since she's not racked by a chakra disease, she'll be able to maintain one of the most powerful Susanos on Earth longer than her uncle ever could. Which may not make her the most powerful person in the universe, but it will make her a formidable foe. And thus, the real truth behind Sarada's MS design is not only that she will be the illuminator of the darkness of the world, but also she'll be the reincarnation of Itachi. And that's good enough for me. But what do you guys think? Do you believe that the connection between Sarada's MS and the Yadamira is circumstantial or coincidental? Tell me in the comments below. And why guys are down there, please, for me. Like the video, subscribe to the page, hit that noti bell. Simply, there's no way she doesn't get the Yadimir, right? Like, I know I'm obviously doing my self-congratulatory laps a little early, but, like, this one's set in stone, right?